Hey gardeners, in this video we're going to talk about how to manage tropicals in high pH environments like we all experience here in the valley in Arizona. So if you want to grow trees like avocado, jaboticaba, sapodilla, and especially mango, we need to do a few things extra for these plants to mitigate the conditions in the soil and our water. We've all seen those unicorn trees, you know, the ones that are 50 feet tall that were planted from seed several decades ago. And that's a testament to the fact that you can grow tropicals from seed here and get them to work. The vast majority of us are growing grafted mangoes and those mangoes come from Florida. So those trees were grown in a completely different pH environment and even soil construct. You know, in Florida, the soils are just naturally loamy and sandy there. They are not clay. When I first planted mangoes about five years ago, I didn't realize that our clay soil and our high pH water was contributing to nutritional deficiencies that would really set up the tree to, to basically decline and die. So since then, I've changed things up and this video is gonna be all about the strategies I use to support these plants, to get around our pH issues and ensure that they can eat and do well. I'll just start out with a, a basic test, give you a baseline. So I'm just gonna fill this bucket up with some water from my hose that's attached to my outdoor spigot this digital pH tester to get a reading of our pH in the water. We are coming in around 7.5. So that is straight from the city water supply. All right, so the main issue with having that high pH in the water is for when we fertilize our trees with a liquid fertilizer. You know, you have to dilute the fertilizer before you apply it to the trees, whether you're doing a full year application or you're doing a soil drench. In both circumstances, if you've got your food mixed with high pH, the plant's not gonna be able to uptake that. When I'm mixing up fertilizer in a bucket to go feed my trees, the easiest way that I can deal with the pH is to add a few drops of a solution like this. This is a Fertilone product. It's called Soil Acidifier Plus Iron. A closer view of that product, and I'll also link it in the description. Give this a little shake. So the liquid is, looks like a milky green color out of the bottle. We'll just mix that up a little bit. So you can see now our pH is reading 5.6 around that level with adding that solution in. Okay, so we talked about high pH in water and what we can do to help adjust that, at least when you're feeding your trees. Let's also talk about soil. So if you have your soil tested and you haven't done anything to it, you know, you haven't amended it with anything, you're likely gonna come up with a reading around eight. Keep in mind that you don't have to completely change the pH of your soil, you know, feet down. It's really just the top eight inches of soil where your tree's feeder roots are. So that's really the depth of soil that we want to change or modify. And to do that is, is relatively simple. So I'm definitely not the first channel to mention this. There are quite a few videos on this on YouTube, but the way to deal with this is elemental sulfur. This is the product that I get, um, it's Tiger 90 CR. This is a 50 pound bag. I got this just online at an agricultural store. You can do the same. Just a quick glance at what this looks like. You can see it's dry, pelletized, kind of a yellow color. So it's recommended to just sprinkle this around your trees. The bag will tell you the application rate. I do this four times a year. This will keep your soil pH where your tree needs it in the right range. 
Elemental sulfur is not just needed for tropicals. Actually, all your fruit trees are gonna benefit, including citrus, from putting this stuff down. It's gonna help make macro and micronutrients more bioavailable to the tree so that it can actually eat what you put down. All right, so the base to my fertilizer is a fish fertilizer. Um, there are different brands out there. Uh, there's the, the Alaska brand. All right, this is a 511 solution. That's one possibility. Uh, this is another one I like to use. It's a 222 Kellogg's brand that also has some kelp in there, as well as molasses. And the molasses will help with increasing microbial activity. So depending on which one's on sale, you know, these are both organic choices. I'll go with one of those. So that's my base for the fertilizer. Mangoes are often iron deficient, especially if you see pale leaves or bleaching, you definitely know that your plant is now at the point that it's suffering, right? It's showing you signs that it's deficient. I try to not uh, get the plant to that point. I try to give the iron to it in regular intervals to prevent chlorosis and issues with iron deficiency. If you leave a plant iron deficient for too long, it will start showing worse signs than just bleaching. You'll actually see stem or branch die back and the entire tree can actually die from that deficiency. So it's really important that you're putting a good source of iron down, a chelated form of iron down. Using a non-chelated form of iron, you would have to have acidic soil. There's another form of iron available. It's a fully chelated form, and it's what I've got right here. It's the EDDHA. All right, so this, this product basically allows you to put it down on the plant and it to be bioavailable even if your pH is not in that ideal range, isn't acidic. This product will work with a pH between 7 and 8.5, whereas a non-chelated form will not work for your plant. Especially at the beginning, when your soil is not down to the level you want, you want to use a product like this to ensure that your plant can actually uptake it. Chelated manganese is another thing that I add to the regimen of care for my mangoes and other subtropicals, just like iron. Most tropicals are deficient in manganese, again, because of our high pH. It's not available to the plant. You need to provide the plant that micronutrient in a form that it can uptake. This is the product I use. It's made from Greenway Biotech. So on maintenance, three times a year, I will feed my tropicals, including my mangoes, with this chelated manganese. Another thing that I like to add is Super Thrive. It's just a vitamin formulation. I just add a couple of drops of that to my fertilizer. I just find that it helps with the health and vigor of the plant. So beyond doing soil drench type fertilizer applications, I also am a very big proponent of foliar feeding. Studies report that nutrient uptake is eight to nine times higher when you do a foliar application than a soil drench. Most literature tells you don't foliar feed, you know, if your high temperatures are in excess of 80. So what that means for us usually is that we do this in spring and fall. That you're, you're also gonna wanna do that at the right time of the day. So either early morning, or when the sun has gone down. That's when the stomata are open. When we're talking about doing a Folger feed, I'm gonna use the same composition of products. So per one gallon of water, I'm gonna use two ounces of that Fertilome uh, soil acidifier to bring down the pH in the water as well as um, put in micronutrients into the plant. I'm gonna use half an ounce of fish fertilizer. I'll put some Super Thrive, just a drop of that into the solution. And then the last thing I do is I add a surfactant. So this is the product I use, uh, Yucca Wet. The purpose of a wetting agent or a surfactant is to break water tension on the droplets. So that rather than that solution beating up and just rolling off the leaves, 
it actually allows it to penetrate fully and consistently across the leaf. So an important one to add, and I add just a few drops of that to my foliar solution. If you want to build healthy soil, you're going to want to inoculate your soil with mycorrhiza. I do this when I plant the tree. Inevitably, there are environmental factors that will cause these colonies that develop to decline or even die off completely. One of them is our water suppliers, the cities, add chlorine and chloramine to the water. Chlorine loses its efficacy or its concentration when it's exposed to air, so that's not so much of a concern. But chloramine, which is what I'm told a combination between chlorine and uh, ammonia, that actually is used a lot by water suppliers because it stays in the water. The purpose of it is to kill off pathogens, to kill off bad things that are in your water. Just like with mo most things, it's not going to target just the um, strains of bacteria that we consider bad and leave the good ones alone that you want for your plants. It's going to indiscriminately kill everything. I, ch I actually have a filter that I put onto my hose so with the hose water, you know, that's, that's definitely going to be a good strategy to help reduce the chloramines going into the ground when I'm feeding trees and also when I'm doing flood irrigation. Um, I do like to flood the trees a couple times a year just to try to push those salts, the buildup, out of the soil. Now that doesn't address my irrigation lines. Those are still going to have you know, city water, raw, the way that they supply it. I don't really have a way of filtering out chloramines there. So because of that, I do tend every year around this time to re-inoculate the soil around my trees with mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza is really important to help support healthy roots and allow the tree to take up nutrients. You know, there's lots of studies on mycorrhiza showing its importance. This next topic has nothing to do with pH, but I think it's something that's important to talk about because you likely will experience it. And that is dealing with fungal disease. I know it sounds potentially absurd that we'd have to deal with that in our climate. You know, we are dry and hot. However, a lot of us put down wood chips. So wood chips and mulch are fantastic for, you know, conditioning your soil and definitely reducing evaporation when you water. But at the same time, they do increase humidity and moisture, which are two conditions that disease really favors. Well, issues can attack a mango tree. They are fairly susceptible to that, even though we are not in Florida. Again, we're creating this condition of moisture and humidity with the wood chips, and that can happen. It can also happen in winter. You can't control, you know, the rain falling down when it's cold. And when you have that cold and wet all around a plant with the low temperature, that can promote disease. Even, even a peach tree or a nectarine is susceptible to this. I actually just lost a peach tree this year that I had in the ground for five years. I didn't really pay attention to the signs, uh, the rust coloration on the leaves, and I didn't treat it in time, and I lost the tree. For prevention of disease, I'd recommend applying a copper fungicide once a year. So I just did this for my mango trees because we had a wet summer, and I may also apply this in spring if we had an unusually wet winter, just to head it off. So the copper fungicide is a pretty easy thing to do. You just um, dilute it according to instructions, uh, you might also want to put a surfactant on there, just a couple of drops of the Yucca Wet to increase that penetration into the leaves. But basically just spray this onto the leaves. So if you don't actually have any symptoms of disease, I definitely recommend putting down some plastic if you want to retain, again, your soil life. This is a fungicide. It's very possible that it can kill good bacteria again. So to not take that chance, you can put just a plastic garbage bag down around the trunk to catch all of that excess 
uh, solution. If you do have an issue, then you might actually want to allow that to fall into the soil and may even want to do a soil drench as well as a foliar application of the fungicide. In the past, I neglected this task. You know, I heard, oh, it's just too hot. Fungus just can't exist here. Well, it can. I actually saw it in the form of black spot and some rust on my mangoes. Um, even recently on my roses, I saw some black spot mildew and things. So if left unchecked, you know, your tree could completely succumb to fungal disease. So I don't want to take that chance with these tropicals. So just another thing that I do in annual care. Most of my fruit trees, I want to train them low. Um, you know, residential lot, I want the fruit within picking reach. So I shorten the trees when I first put them in the ground. I pug them really low. I don't want them any taller than two feet. And when you do that, when you shorten your tree, basically head back that central leader, you're gonna force scaffold branches to emerge out the side. That does quite a few things. It's going to make the tree more stable when it comes to winds. If you have a really tall tree, you know, that isn't bushy, but just really tall and lanky, it's possible that that's really gonna get whipped around by the wind and you could even have breakage of limbs. That's also not going to be ideal when it comes to fruit set. Eventually when your fruit trees start bearing, you know, within three years or more of age, you're going to want to support that fruit. So I like to train my trees low, strong scaffolds to support the fruit. Their benefit to trimming them low and really keeping them compact is that you're going to have better fruit set right because more energy can go into the fruit a tree doesn't have to support all this top growth so you not only will get more fruit set but also bigger fruits and really the final benefit is that it is easier to protect if we have a really wicked winter and you need to put frost cloth on it you know if your tree is huge you're not going to be able to protect it but if it's around your height chances are it'd be pretty easy to throw up some stakes and frost cloth over it if you need to. And as always, I am not an expert in this. I'm just a gardener trying to share what I know with you. Thanks for watching and happy gardening.